The situation is very, very bad. In the current report, the 11th report for the United Nations, submitted just a month ago to the Human Rights Council, I used the words harrowing and horrific. It's really horrific on many, many fronts. And we must expose it to the world. While we must not despair, because we must mobilize the world community to pressure more for accountability and change in the country of origin. In that perspective, I also know that over the past six years, if you ask me what has improved, there has been nominal, very small improvement in regard to legislative changes. They have a new section in their constitution as of last year, which now uses the word human rights. I guess it's better to have it there than not. But of course, their version of human rights is about protecting the elite at the top and the play on the external threat debate rather than genuine protection of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. So the situation remains very bad. But the work of the rapporteur is not only to try to impact upon internally what happens in DPRK, it is his or her work also to inform the world. This reporting process is the only one of the United Nations that uses a variety of information, government, non-government, intergovernmental, analyzed independently by a pro bono helper, that's me. And it is the only one that motivates the world community directly to vote on the situation twice a year. What does the world think of the situation? There are votes in the Human Rights Council, in the General Assembly every year, to castigate, to castigate the authorities in the DPRK for the rampant violations of human rights that take place in a very broad range of fields. So it is important, this work for the world community, and it influences directly world public opinion, in a very humble sense, from me. And as importantly as that, it is the only mechanism that has access to people, the refugees directly, on this front. I sit there interviewing refugees directly in Hanawan, in Hangyore School, I see them in different quarters here and there. It is the voice of those who do not have a voice. And I'm very proud to be a voice for those who do not have a voice. And to make the UN accessible to people at large. The UN has to be at the field level to heal, to support, to help. And it's great to be part of that process of hope of being accessible to people. So that is the retrospect, dear friends. Mobilization, communication, information, hope, hope offered by us all. Secondly, let's come to the aspect situation of the current situation. I'm asked by the UN to cover a range of issues, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, all together, food and more, specific groups, women's issues, children's issues, and more, humanitarian aid, and more, to promote better implementation of human rights. I would recognize that the DPRK is a party to four human rights treaties, and there's a linchpin for them to engage with the world community. They're parties to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Women's Convention, and the Child Rights Convention. And recently, recently, they also engaged with this new assessment process of human rights in the UN system called the Universal Pure Review, UPR. Now, from that review process, there were some 117 to 20 recommendations addressed to the DPRK to consider and to come back 
to the United Nations to say whether they would accept or not accept those recommendations. On the day when they came back to the United Nations in Geneva last month, I was physically in the room, not as a rapporteur, but as an observer. And what did they do? The representatives did not commit, it was non-committal, to support the recommendations, which are very logical recommendations, to improve the human rights situation in the country. So that non-commitment means ultimately poor performance, poor commitment, and poor implementation as manifested in the attitude shown to the world community last month in the Human Rights Council. So let's come to some other areas which are aspects of concern. Number one, food. My reports usually start with the food situation. And we know that particularly since the 1990s, there's been huge food shortage. And at the end of the decade, they started to take food aid from outside. I support food aid, subject to the need to monitor that the food gets to the people. But we know very well that while there is food shortage in DPRK, it is also a question of diversion of food from the people to the elite. It is not only a question of food aid shortage, it's a question of misallocation, distortion of food distribution, and also neglect in terms of food security. The authorities need to support the people to grow food and to enjoy the fruits of what they grow, rather than being extorted, the people are extorted levied in terms of having to give a part of their share to the top. And when the people wish to trade, wish to earn, wish to enjoy some of the fruits of their labor, sadly, for the past three, four years now, the authorities have been clamping down on the market system, preventing people from earning their keep and from trading to earn some money, especially where the authorities are not able to satisfy the basic needs of the people. The authorities have been clamping down on small plot farming, been clamping down on women who wish to trade, imposing ridiculous conditions such as prohibiting women under I think, 49 from trading, prohibiting women from wearing trousers and um, riding bicycles because those are also the tools that go into market. Now the situation may be a little bit more relaxed. But it is obvious that while food aid is important, we must talk about balanced food distribution as well as equitable flows of food to the people not being extorted as they are by the authorities, as well as to ensure food security. And having said that, yes, I still welcome food aid, and there is shortage. The World Food Programme is now running out of stock by June of this year. And currently, the World Food Programme is only able to support aid for about 1.5 million people, no more than 2 million, even though, depending on statistics, between 6 million to 9 million people are food deprived today. The fault is on the shoulders of the authorities. Secondly, other basic needs. We are also short of medicines. Swine flu has arrived. Pneumonia is rampant. We're short of electricity. We're short of fertilizers and more. Those also depend upon how the government should react and act. To rectify the mis-expenditure, the authorities are not short of money. They earn billions from trade, but they spend that on the nuclearization process rather than on the people to satisfy their basic needs. So it is a question of the need to reallocate resources from the military budget to the people. What they have put in the new parts of the Constitution, particularly military first policy, should be substituted for by a people first policy. Thirdly, the question of civil